I just disclosed to Ari, this was my first time seeing the director's cut. Um, I uh, saw the theatrical cut when it was new, but um, I am very much still processing the newness of this version. Um, and I guess uh, to start off, we can dive right in. Uh, can you talk about uh, the background of this film? I'm sure that um, I'm sure that our audience has varying degrees of knowledge about where this movie came from. Um, but if you could just talk about its inception and, and development, and in particular um, how the theatrical cut developed and then the director's cut emerged in the aftermath of what was released in theaters. Um, well, uh, it's a long story <laughs> regarding how, how the film came about. Um, I had just written Hereditary, um, which I had not made yet. Um, and this Swedish production company read Hereditary and they wanted me to, uh, to write a folk horror film set in Sweden. Um, and I was going through a breakup at the time. <laughs> and uh, I, I had written many scripts, but I'd, I'd never done anything uh, that had been commissioned. Uh, but I saw a way of kind of marrying <coughs> the breakup movie to the structure of a folk horror film. And in many ways, it kind of, it gave me uh, like a framework that I could actually hang personal stuff onto. Um, and so it, 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 it opened it up. For, uh, for me, and so that's that's how it started, um, and the, I guess the way that the director's cut came about was that the movie was fucking long, and <laughs> it was, and we had uh, uh, three hours and forty-five minute long uh, uh, assembly cut, um, but that was an assembly cut that I oversaw, so it was. You know, we, we cut the movie together and then that was, it was almost four hours long. So this is not the whole movie. Um, and, but you know, we, we, we got it down to a certain point. Um, I think we got it down to two hours and 42 minutes. And at that point, I just did not want to touch it. And I, I started warning people, like this is, we're gonna have a two hour and 45 minute movie. Um, and they said, and then A24, who is amazing, um, they, they were very gentle with me, and they just said, well, just keep, just keep going. <laughs> I said, I'm telling you, it's not gonna happen. And, and so this was a long process of chipping away at it, and we got to a cut that I was very happy with. The theatrical cut is, I, I cut that I, with, with my editor, Luke, um, and I, approve it, and I, I, I'm, I'm happy with that cut, uh, but there were things that were very painful to cut, and by the time we got to the theatrical cut, I was actually, I was like, I was fine with what we had removed, but um, I had spent so long in the editing room repeating over and over again, there's gonna be a director's cut, um, <laughs> that I just realized I, you know, I kinda had to see that through, and then it was invited here, um, and so I, I actually wasn't even sure at that point, like, wait, should there be a director's cut? And then as I was putting everything back in, I realized, like, this is a different film. Um, their relationship is different. Like, there, there, there are things that sort of bolster other things in this cut that I, I always did miss. And, um, you know, just like the thesis is, I feel like not quite as robust, like that, that subplot is not quite, quite as robust in the, um, in the theatrical cut. And I, and I feel like their relationship has a whole other chapter to it uh, that we had to remove um, to get the time down. We couldn't just remove one scene. If you remove one scene, kind of like this almost 15 minute section goes with it, which is the lake scene and, the, and them arguing in the field, which was always sort of the you know, it's, 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 uh, it, it was sort of like a centerpiece, like in the same way that, that the attest upon feels like a centerpiece in, in, um, in the theatrical, that, that, that 
for me was always the marker of like we're right in the middle now. So I have to say it. Um, I think it's a testament to uh, the integrity of the theatrical cut that this cut did not feel any longer to me. And if anything, um, it was um, it was a different movie, but um, the, the way that the relationship was developed um, in greater detail and the way that some of the exposition and the uh, sort of mythology and world building of this town was developed felt uh, like, of course that's there. Like, that's just what we didn't see in the theatrical cut. And um, was that conscious? Was that how you went about, um, like, did was that strategic or did it just sort of the things that felt inessential that you could cut, but then came back in organically? Well, there are a lot of things that I didn't feel were inessential that were, that were really painful to cut. Like, I didn't want to lose the lake scene. Um, one, because it, it, it makes sense of Connie's death at the end when you see her in the same outfit that that boy is wearing, um, that she was drowned, you know. Um, that for me was like a painful loss. And, um, and so, you know, the, but, but the things that we cut um, after we had arrived at two hours and 42 minutes, um, the things that we cut from there were things that, you know, were, it, it was really the product of a lot of talking through everything with my editor, Luke for a long time and arguing and, and, you know, and, and it took us a long time to arrive at that final cut because you think something's gonna work but you have to watch the movie all the way through uh, once you try something to see if it does and, you know, and, and often it didn't because in, then you'd realize, oh, well this, by, by taking this scene out, this thread has no spine now. Um, so we'd put that back in and try something else and it was, um, it was, a, it was a real lesson for me to like, I, you know, to kind of have a sense of, so was Hereditary, which was also a longer film uh, before it arrived at, a, at its final iteration. Um, but to understand, okay, uh, I write these screenplays that are pretty chunky and this is, this is how I pace certain scenes and this is how I like to live in these things and it results in a length that, you know, um, doesn't make sense for uh, you know a, a a a wide theatrical release, which I was very lucky to get on on both films, um, given that they are both low budget films. You mentioned uh, in your intro that um, you had some shorts that were shown in the New York Film Festival. Um, I'll admit I have not seen your shorts, but um, I'm interested in the, uh, the fact that you. Um, as many filmmakers do, got your start making shorts and have pretty um, fluently evolved into these sort of epic length um, and yet very sort of intricate, intimate scaled uh, dramas essentially that are, that are um, very drawn out and very lived in and very, um, the opposite of short films. And I wonder if you could just talk about that difference and um, how you got from there to here. Your work. Um, well, the shorts were also pretty overlong. Um, <laughs> like the, the most notorious one is The Strange Thing with the Johnsons, and that one is 30 minutes, which is is that even a short? Like, what the fuck is that? That's, it's, uh, it's an episode. Um, and, uh, and that's one reason that the film didn't get in anywhere. We, we sent it everywhere for a year, and it was just rejected by everybody, um, which was painful because, you know, I, I, w I was excited about the film and just wanted to show it to an audience. Um, and at the end of that year, the New York Film Festival took it on, which was really big. Um, and then it got leaked online and became a thing. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, even, I mean, I, I started doing this portrait series, uh, which I didn't get too far into. I made three of them. And, you know, the first one, which is called Basically, which was the other film that got into the New York Film Festival, uh, is, you know, over 15 minutes. And it just, it just, it's just like, there are, 
there's five minutes that I wish I cut from those, um, from that one. Uh, so, I don't know. I, I like long movies, obviously. Um, I, really, I really like to just live in worlds and live in, li live in movies, and I'm talking as a viewer, you know? Like, I, if, if a movie's good, I wanna stay in it. Um, and so, the intention here was always to make something that viewers can live in. Um, and I, 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 I feel closer to this version because it feels a little bit closer to what I originally intended, which was basically to make a film that you kind of have to give yourself to and just like lie in. Um, and I, I know that it, it immediately loses a certain percentage of the audience who are just not accustomed to that kind of pacing and you know, I, I've, I've heard a lot of, uh, like, you could, you could have lost 30 minutes from that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm always hearing that. What, uh, what went into the world building in this one? What kind of, um, to what extent were you uh, drawing from research and, and sort of a realist approach versus, um, what the end result was this this uh, very real feeling world that was also very clearly stylized and very um, uh, sort of visually abstracted even in points and and um, and yet feels researched and feels uh, true and and I'm interested in where it came from how you got there well it it is the product of a lot of research um, and I took liberties with almost all of the research, but I, 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 I hope the, the line is pretty blurry and that you know, everything feels both like it's rooted in something real and also feels like you know, just otherworldly and you know, fantastical. Um, and you know, the film was always des designed to be a fairy tale, uh, but hopefully one that's grounded enough that you, that you just sort of buy into it. Um, but you, and more and more that it just kind of becomes a fairy tale. It just it just like that that part of the film, kind of. I'm hoping, like those tendrils, like really just end up wrapping themselves around the whole thing by the end. Um, and one reason I really uh, one reason I'm happy with this cut as well is because all of the songs uh, found their way in. We 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 um, had this really brilliant. Um, vocal artist named Jessica Kenny, who um, who specializes in devotional music, and she wrote all of the uh, the choral songs that kind of saturate the film. And cutting a lot of those was painful too, because I'm I was really happy with the work she did on this. What? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, it's a very funny film, um, and uh, as this audience can attest to, there was a lot of uh, communal response to the humor in the film. Uh, and um, I certainly think of that as, as one of the defining qualities of this film. It is both very dread-infused and um, sort of existentially terrifying, but also extremely funny, and uh, in a way that's woven into the script and the editing, and uh, that I think we get an even richer sampling of in this longer cut. And um, how did you approach the comedy in this inherently not necessarily obviously funny story uh, that uh, ends up being very funny? I mean, I, I see the film as kind of a dark comedy. Um, when we get to the ending, I'm always kind of giggling through that whole thing. Um, especially just he's in that bear suit and he's, <laughs> he can't move his face and just the guy who's sentencing him to, you know, <laughs> he's, being, he's gonna be banished to the deepest recesses where he can reflect on his wickedness <laughs> as, a, as a bad boyfriend. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I find it just kind of funny. Um, so I don't know how I approach, I, 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 I mean, ultimately I, I try not to be too as I'm writing, I 
try to have it be pretty fluid and it, and and just get the characters talking to each other and and usually when I'm trying to be funny it's something I have to cut because it's not funny. Um, <laughs> but um, but yeah, I'm 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 always pleased to hear the laughter in the audience. That's that's I that's what I want. I <laughs> Good to hear. <laughs> Uh, I uh, I want to throw it out to the audience, um, but before I do, one quick last question: uh, Is there significance to the Austin Powers moment? I don't know. If, I don't know if this is something you've talked about in other interviews. Uh, I mean, that's just again, that's a, uh, an example of something that made me laugh. That I I mean, I could ruin it by talking about it. <laughs> but, don't do yeah. that. Okay, we can open it up to the audience. There's a lot of you guys here, so. And I will really quickly, quickly say that the Austin Powers thing, which was really just like a gut thing, apparently it's very big in Sweden. And so, <laughs> so I, I've heard from a lot of Swedes that that was right on the, like, right on the money. Hello? Woo, very loud. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, have you seen Edward Yang, and did he perhaps affect your affinity towards lengthier, settle-in narratives? Well, un I mean, I've, I obviously have never met him since he's unfortunately dead. Um, but he's he's a really important filmmaker to me. Really, really, really important. Um, I mean, Bartis even even down to like Mahjong and Taipei Story, but especially especially, especially Brighter Summer Day and 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 Yi Yi. Um, anyway, if anybody hasn't seen Edward Yang, beautiful, check him out. Beautiful. Yeah, just your cinematography reminds me of a bit of just that. Uh, yeah, that that's a beautiful compliment. I yeah. I really appreciate that. I I love him. Yeah. Oh God. Thank God. Hi. Thanks for coming down. So I don't mean to get too much into the trailer because I realize you maybe didn't create the trailer, but there was a scene in the trailer of someone levitating, and I was curious if. In your head, you wanted to go more into some of the religious and spiritual aspects of the community. Have you ever had an intention of doing that? I'm curious what your thoughts are in the background. Um, yeah, so I don't, I don't cut the trailers. Um, uh, that image is from uh, the sex temple right after his robe is taken off, which we cut from. Um, I had... I had his feet levitating from from there, which is which is you know it's meant to be in his head. He's tripping, and then he uh, he you know kind of floats across the room towards Maya's open legs, um, which was a nice and scandalous image. And I I really like the shot. Um, it took us a while to get it right, um, but it just I I could see all the I could just hear all the confused people. Uh, complaining, and I just didn't didn't want to hear it. <laughs> so, um, so I took that out. So, in terms of the final girl trope, which a lot of horror movies use, and usually it's the picture of the woman screaming as she runs out of the cabin, happy she's alive. You ended with a catharsis of the final girl finding community among what she once feared. Did you get to that point? Was that part of the breakup movie or the horror movie that you wanted to end with? Uh, well, okay, so I see the film in two ways uh, in regards to that question. One, it's it, the, like I, I wanted to make a, a feel-good movie for dissatisfied partners. <laughs> um, <laughs> so... Um, and in this cut, Christian is even more of a disappointment. Um, <laughs> uh, and we get to hear her apologize even more for things that she should not be apologizing for. Um, and if it is a horror film, I'm not totally convinced that it's an overt horror film. I, I love the horror genre. I think Hereditary is a horror movie, no question about it. Um, I, again, I see this more as, more as a fairy tale, but if it is a horror, if, if it is a horror film, I see it as a, a, a horror movie about codependency. And so she goes from a dysfunctional codependent relationship to, in the end, a more functional codependent relationship, which is arguably much more codependent. <laughs> um, so I absolutely wanted it to feel cathartic. I also, you know, I, 
I, I felt like if you're gonna end the movie on this, you know, uh, uh, this ritual where people are purging and it's supposed to be totally cathartic, like why not, why not reflect that in the filmmaking? Um, but, uh, but I hope that the catharsis you feel while you're watching it is kind of like unmuddied and that as you walk away, it, it sort of becomes more complicated. That's the hope. Hi. Uh, Hi. So we were just talking about how you like really have blended the genres together um, with like horror and like the um, like breakup movie. And I was kind of just thinking during this and a little before, like that's kind of what Gremlins is in a way. So I was wondering, like, what would your take on a Gremlins movie be? <laughs> um, well, not the breakup part, but you I mean, know, mixing genres and horror. And stuff. I mean, I don't think I can improve upon the new batch. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, I'm so happy you said that. So, Everyone, give him a hand. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare <laughs> fuck with Gremlins. That's, oh. Gremlins well, well, like if you maybe you made your own creature movie. I'd love to. I, I, love, I love a good creature movie. We haven't had a good one since The Host. Mm. Have we? Maybe, maybe we have, and I'll, I'll eat those words, but um, I'm trying to think of the last one. Anyway, yeah, love creature movies. Awesome. Look forward to it. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, hi, yeah. I'm really just fascinated on your use of anthropology within, within this movie, especially with, like, Franz Boaz's use of participation and observation with um, Danny being this very participatory character and uh, Christian just really observing everything. And I just want to get your opinion. How do you see anthropology sort of growing within the horror genre? I mean, we have Campbell Holocaust, we have The Serpent and the Rainbow, and I just sort of want to get your opinion on how this can grow. Oh man, how can it grow? I don't know, I just, this is my, con my contribution. Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, I've. <laughs> I mean, these are bad anthropologists. <laughs> I mean, these, I think that's why they die. Yeah. yeah. No, of course, of course, they they're doing everything wrong. Um, and I guess, I mean. Ultimately, it, 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 I, I, I cannot speak to where I want it to go or, 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 or uh, like what I see for the future um, of anthropology and movies. Um, you, I'm sure many people would call this a very reductive <laughs> view of, of anthropology. Um, uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. I... I've said this before, I think I said this um, at a it, was a, it was a, it was a film comment talk on this, um, but for me, I just, there's nothing reflects the meaninglessness of life better than two people arguing about a thesis. <laughs> um, and this is sort of an existential movie, so I just felt like that was, yeah, anyway. <laughs> It's as much a movie about academia as it is about anthropology, I think. Yeah, yeah, about academia and, and the, uh, the silliness of that, too. Uh. Hi. Um, Hi. So I've been kind of grappling with this question for pretty much the entire year, but um, the thing that I'm kind of having an issue with is like people that are sharing a certain perspective through art that haven't necessarily experience that perspective. And so, because I love your movies, I, I do. Um, and you kind of often portray your, your themes and your and kind of the whole movie through the perspective of women. How do you kind of approach that, um, especially as someone like yourself? Like a man? Yeah, like a man. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, you know, for every character, I just, I figure I can just put myself in their shoes and put myself into those characters as much as I can. Um, and hopefully they'll be believable and they'll be rich, um, at least as rich as I am. 
Um, and uh, I mean, there's a lot of me and Danny. And so I, 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 I haven't really had to wrestle with how do I feel about this because I, I see a lot of myself in her. And no matter what, like, you know, if these characters are, are gonna be a surrogate um, in one way or another. Um, and I don't know, there's a lot of me in Annie, the, the, the character that Toni Collette plays in, in, in Hereditary. Um, a lot of parts of myself that, you know, that I feel very close to and a lot of parts of myself that I'm not thrilled with. Um, and so, I don't know. It's, you know, I, I try not to, it's up, it's up to you guys to sort of politicize or, you know, to, to, to decide whether it, it, it's okay or whether it works. It, it is a question that I ask as well. Um, and not just with her or with Tony Collette's character. Um, but, but that question of representation is, is huge. Um, and um, I, I'm somebody who enjoys wrestling with it and seeing where I can push certain things. Anybody who knows the short I made, Strange Thing with the Johnsons, knows that I kind of like to see what's okay and, and, and I, I kind of, I, I, I enjoy putting something out there and then stepping back and watching I mean, right now, obviously, with Twitter and with just where the world is, it's very easy to like provoke a response. Um, and uh, and you know, I think certain movies can get lost in that response as well. So you have to be careful. You have to make sure that what you're doing is responsible in one way or another, even if you know the the aim is 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 to provoke. Um, anyway, that's my half-assed non-answer, but. <laughs> I think we have time for a couple of more questions. Um, yes, this uh, lady on the, yep, yep. Just keep your hand up, yep. Hi, thank you so much for this movie. It's just really satisfying. Um, <laughs> uh, when you're working with Florence Pugh, she gets so physically racked with like grief. It's like, I want to give her a hug. And I'm wondering, um, how did you work her to there? And how did you work her back down as a director? Um. I typically didn't work her. <laughs> Direct her. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm kidding. Um, no, I, uh, I mean, I tried to make things very clear in the script, like when a moment requires something extra, and, and I try to be very, very clear. Um, so, so when we get to those scenes, the actor, you know, knows that something's coming that they have to prepare for. Um, and we talk about it a lot. Um, and if you're working with great actors, um, as I was here, um, you, you don't really have to push them or provoke them or manipulate them. Um, they know what their job is. Um, and they, you know, if, it, it, sometimes they'll need help, and, and I'm there to try to help them. Um, so you can see like all of my self-loathing like peeking through, and just the way I word things. <laughs> like I'll, I'll try. Um, you did good. But yeah. but, um, but you know, Florence is really, really a remarkable actress, and she's she's totally untrained. Um, is she, it, 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 the way she talks about it is like, yeah, I thought maybe I'd go to an audition a couple of years ago. <laughs> and, you know, and so she's just really a natural. Um, and so I, typically her instincts were just right on the money and I could just sort of sit behind the monitor and, and enjoy what she was doing. I mean, I'm, I'm a bit dictatorial when it comes to blocking and you know, I map everything out in a shot list before I talk to anybody, even on the crew. Um, and I think that can drive actors nuts sometimes. Um, but beyond that, beyond kind of staging, I, 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 I try to just let them do their thing uh, until I need to step in for any reason. And, I, and then I try to not be too verbose, which is actually pretty rough for me. I, and uh, I wish we had time for more, but uh, one more question. I see this wreath moving around back there. 
I thought it would pay off. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think you said a little bit of this during your answer a few questions ago about um, like choosing during the movie. It seems so obvious that um, like looking at the oracles paintings or looking at the ceremonies, it seems you're giving the audience a true choice each time they watch something as how they should respond rather than how you're trying to get them to respond. Would that, is that, um, something that you do or try to leave it? Because some people are like, oh, this definitely means this. Do you try to leave it to the audience or do you have something in mind that you're trying to get across? Uh, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, in many ways, what I do is not ambiguous, you know? I mean, the, the films end pretty, uh, on, on, on pretty extreme notes. Um, mm. Even but, the audiences, pardon yeah. me, even the audiences, sometimes in, I'm in a theater laughing all the way through and other people are like, oh, how dare you laugh through that part? Yeah, that's great. <laughs> that's great. Um, I, that, that's, that's what I want. Uh, you know, I, I do love to put important infor, um, information in, into like, you know, the margins and I love peripheral details that you either pick up or you don't. And if you don't pick them up, the movie is still gonna, you know, it's still gonna be clear enough. Um, but then if, if you do pick them up, it's, it's like, it's a little, you know, piece of treasure that you can kind of take with you that, to inform different things. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I I try to pack it with, as full as I can with just detail. Um, and I, I'm, it's not that I'm like a fan of like Easter eggs, really. It's just that I, I, I want there to be things that you can find in the frame at all times. Um, and, I, I, and that's why I like to hold so long on, on, cert, on certain shots because, you know, I, I I, I want to give it the opportunity to sort of roam the frame and and you know get get a feeling for where we are. Um, but really, more than anything, I just feel like when you do that, when you when when you try to be as generous as you can, but also when you when you pull things back and kind of allow the audience to find certain to find certain things themselves, it tends to encourage a more active engagement on the part of the viewer. And I know that that's how I feel when I watch films. Um, so it's definitely something I'm trying to do and, and I'm, 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 I'm happy to hear that it, it's worked that way for you. We could take a longer cut of it too. <laughs> <laughs> you, don't, you don't want that, nobody wants that. Make a mini series. Um, I'm really sad to say that that is all the time that we have this evening. Um, so please join me one more time in thanking Aaron. Thanks.